actually around this time we go on walks and um, so uh, just please forgive us if there's any noise in the background or anything else, but please do also mute yourselves so that everybody else can hear. I might have to turn off my video at some point, um, usually around this time for some reason my my internet connection slides down and starts getting all choppy. So Dancy, please feel ready to like take over if you don't mind. Um, obviously, culture of respect. Um, let's respect each other. Let's make sure that you know, obviously, no obscene language or anything like that that takes place. Um, and then you know, obviously, let us know how everything's going. Um, obviously, it, you know, anything feedback that you might have about the process. Um, I am your new PM, and I'll explain that as we go in a little bit. Um, and then I'm not sure if everybody's aware of, but obviously, we have um, our um, our page for the project where we're trying to update it. We will be updating it with all this new information that you're about to see right now. Um, so this is a little bit of the agenda that we have going on for today. And because technically this is my first meeting as the PM, as a new PM, which uh, obviously is bullet point number three, I would really love it if we can um, actually, if we can go around and just for the team and because it has been again a while, if we don't mind going around and just introducing ourselves um, and who do you represent? Um, and so I am going to um, obviously, well, I'm going to, I'm Gabby Serrado. I am in Dottie's transportation design team. I am the community designer for, uh, for basically Southwest Denver Council Districts 2, 3 and 7. So I think I know the majority of you. Um, but if we haven't worked together, then, you know, I'm glad that we get to work uh, together now. So with that, I am actually going to pass it with to Nancy, um, who's part of uh, who's my my lead consultant team. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Gabby. Um, so I am Nancy Lambertson with Muller Engineering, and I've had the pleasure of being the project manager for the consultant team. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just introduce them rather than trying to do the awkward figuring out who's talking during uh, during these virtual meetings. So Beth just popped on and she has been working with you and us on the stakeholder engagement and also um, mobility. Then we have uh, Mark Nyhoff, Nyhoff on from Muller who has been working in Stormwater. We also have Allison Graham with the Dig Studios and they've been doing a lot of the open space placemaking, public realm uh, visioning. I have Kenneth Ryan from Muller Engineering also on his video, I don't believe is working. And so um, he has been doing the traffic. And then I believe that is the it that is it for now for our uh, consultant team. Thanks, Gabby. And I'm on mute. All right, so I'm going to go down the list. Um, Doug, if you don't mind introducing yourself, and who do you represent? Sure, I'm Doug Monroe. I'm the manager of corridor planning for RTD, um, and uh, we have a significant transit presence in this area, especially with the Decatur Federal Station being uh, located at the kind of the southeast uh, corner of the Colfax and Federal Interchange there. Thank you. Mr. Glenn Harper. Hello. I'm, I'm here. That's Glenn Harper from the Sun Valley Kitchen and Community Center and uh, the RNO, the Sun Valley Community Coalition. Excellent. Thank you, Glenn. Mr. Eugene. Good evening, everyone. Eugene Howard. I'm with Community Planning and Development. I am the uh, project manager for the West Area Plan uh, that uh, includes uh, the Cloverleaf. So thanks a lot for inviting me tonight. Excellent. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, Ms. Jean. Hi, Jean Granville with the Sun Valley Community Coalition, the Registered Neighborhood Organization. Excellent. Thank you, Jean. Ms. Jill. Hi, everybody. Jill Lokendori, Executive Director of the Denver Streets Partnership and Colfax and Federal are my two favorite streets. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, Ms. Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly with Dig Studio. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Ken Ryan. Yeah, Gabby, this is Nancy. Oh, again. sorry, that's, that's, my, that's my consultant. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's okay. His mic's not working anyway. Yeah. Lisa. 
Lisa Sainz, um, I work with Servicios de la Raza and I'm vice president of the Community Coalition in Sun Valley. Oh, perfect, excellent. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan? Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Miles, the West Denver Renaissance Collaborative. Excellent. Um, Melissa from Councilwoman Torres. Hi, uh, Melissa Mejia with Councilwoman Torres' office for District 3, and uh, she should be able to join us as well in a little bit. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I have uh, Mang Yit. Oh, hi there. Hi, everybody. I'm representing Studio Competiva. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, Mr. Nevitt. Howdy, y'all. Chris Nevitt, um, Denver Mayor's Office, TOD Manager. Mr. J. Uh, J. Roberts in Powerfield at Mile High. Excellent. Thank you for joining us, Jay. Pleasure. And then I have, um, well, I think I went through all of them, but I have uh, Win King. I think that's all. Yes, hi, Win King. And um, I am a property owner on West Colfax and a member of the West Colfax Business Improvement District and a commercial broker working in the area. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know that a few people are out on vacation, um, and so we will be posting this uh, this presentation up on the website. So if by any chance somebody from your organization or your neighbors want to know what's going on, um, I will be posting this. I will be sending out for this for uh, to be posted by Friday uh, tomorrow. So feel free to share again the the website, uh, the project website for uh, so that people can see where we're what's going on. So um, a little bit, um, obviously, project manager update. Um, I am not Eileen. Uh, you are. You guys are used to seeing Eileen um, through these meetings. Uh, she was over in Dottie Transportation Planning. Um, unfortunately, our Eileen has joined the dark side and has gone has left the city and county of Denver and has gone to the private sector. Um, so basically, and this happened at the beginning of the year. So that is, you know. A, and we'll go a little bit of sort of like what ha what has happened to your last meeting, uh, but basically I, I I absorbed this project sometime um, in the late February early March timeframe. Um, so that is one of also another one of the reasons why we have sort of had to go on silence mode for uh, for a little bit, just because I I was obviously this is my area. The, I, I'm a, I need to know sort of everything that was part of my job responsibilities. I kind of need to know everything that's happening transportation wise in council districts two, three and seven. Um, however, I was not attending every single meeting and so I needed to catch up with everything that was happening where things have left off. Um, and so basically that's one of the reasons um, why uh, why I'm now sort of leading this project. Obviously I'm aware of you know everything, all of the construction and, and the other different projects in the area. Um, and obviously because of Federal Boulevard, if you guys don't know me, uh, basically I also coordinate uh, the 60 something projects that are happening along Federal Boulevard uh, right now. And so obviously kind of you know fell on my lap. It kind of makes sense to fall on my lap, but that's one of the reasons why we kind of also needed a little bit of a break so that I can understand really you know where this project sort of has been going through um, a little bit. Um, I will definitely post it. Um, actually, Nancy, if you don't mind posting my email um, information on the chat in case you, any of you guys don't have my email. I kind of just realized that Beth is the one that sent this meeting invite. And so um, if I have not worked with you before, then you might not have my email. Uh, so if you don't mind Nancy posting it on the chat, you know, my, my contact info, that'll be great. Um, so that's a little, so a little bit of the, of, you know, obviously some of these slides uh, you, you should remember from, from everything that you guys have already gone through, but a little bit, obviously the purpose um, of this study um, is to evaluate the, the possibility of transforming these 29 acres um, that sit, you know, right between Stadium District and Sloan's, um, you know, the, the neighborhoods, the West Colfax neighborhood, Sun Valley, and the Villa Park neighborhoods, um, and try to figure out, you know, to understand the transportation, connectivity, stormwater uh, needs for any type of future development, whether that is a, a little portion of the 29 acres or the full thing. Um, 
and it needs to respond whatever that you know the the, the point the, one of the intents of this is was to be able to really analyze what it, what was needed in order to really build the right level of infrastructure um and that is supported with what we hear from the community, what is being supported for obviously what is coming up, you know, from the, the new redevelopments that are taking place in Stadium and in Sun Valley um, and, and all of this. So the goal of, you know, the, the goal of this process was to provide CDOT's uh, HTPE options that sort of met the goals of the city and county of Denver as a whole. Um, thankfully, you know, in this last two years, our community uh, planning department has developed uh, a new um, LDR process, large redevelopment uh, process that basically anybody that is that wants to redevelop in these large massive scales in a, this large area, they, it's an internal process that usually it starts with the moment where a developer sort of comes in, right? And they tell the city, what do we want? In this particular case, we were, you know, it, it, we were trying to flip it a little bit and be a little bit more proactive in the sense of, in a sense of like, this is what we would like as a community, as a city, this is what we would like, um, those minimum requirements that are needed for this 29 acres, and what is also, what, what would we desire as a community, how we kind of wish to grow um, on the, you know, for the site. So, um, you, I think you've, hopefully you guys all have seen this or you remember this, there was the discovery phase, there was, you all developed a vision framework, um, and then you develop concept plans um, that met sort of, you know, the, then that should be evaluated basically against that vision framework. One of the big changes um, that has taken place um, is, is that, you know, basically we, the, the original intent was to come down to one uh, preferred sort of a one scenario, one sort of draft scenario. This has been a little bit harder than expected, <laughs> so it, it, you know, one scenario is not going to happen. Um, you know, this project is a little bit, we're already a little bit over schedule for this project. And there is a lot of um, information. There's a lot of um, things that we have to consider. Um, and again, since this is primarily to be sort of that visioning study about to set that parameter about those baseline conditions, you know, that's that's the crucial portion of this. It's like, okay, what, you know, what kind of mobility or what kind of, a, you know, uh, grid, do we want a grid network here? Do we want what kind of level of connections? What kind of local street connectivity? Do we want flexible park space? Like those type of elements is that, that baseline condition. And then in all honesty, we can say whatever, you know, as a group, we can, we can develop whatever concepts and vision we want. But if this is being turned over to the private side, you know, they can come up with so many other wonderful ideas, but as long as they meet that baseline condition. Um, so for a little bit, we were like, you know, banging our heads against the wall, trying to be like, we need to come down to one. And it, you know, it the, when the reality is that the important portion of this is to set that really strong baseline conditions. Like, what do we really want for the site in order to redevelop correctly? So uh basically you know at this point we are you know we are considering just coming down to four and you will see the four and you have already seen the four um a little bit well sort of you've already seen three and um and so that's where sort of a little bit where we're at so the vision framework this is what you all developed um uh all developed and approved back in nancy help me out i should know this date in july last year Yes. Yeah. OK, there you go. Um, obviously, you know, the, you, um, we have open space pl place making um, land use economics, of course, is that's really crucial. Environmental and stormwater. Again, this process, this site, this cloverleaf was built sort of, you know, sort of for that intent. That's why we see that massive footprint um, mobility. And then under each category is equity, resiliency, connectivity and health and safety. You all develop um, what is the definitions for these and you all provided examples uh, for this. So this shouldn't be um, you know, relatively new, but again, all of this is part, part of that. Uh, you can see sort of your progress if by any chance you have forgotten or you want to share it. It's all of it. It's in the in the project website. Um, so basically when we, you know, as we, as you all develop your framework scenarios, this is what we were trying to basically match it up against. How do those scenarios basically, is it a thumbs up, neutral, down, uh, when it comes to mobility and for example, and resiliency, do we strengthen mobility options 
um, by a particular scenario. Yay, no, well, yes, maybe no, basically. Um, so this is sort of that baseline foundation, you know, metrics foundations that we that, that we have been working with since this entire time. Um, and so some of the existing conditions and some of the things that, um, you know, I think you all know that your building, you know, the building blocks for this is obviously um, everything. A lot of things are happening, you know, the intersection of Colfax and Federal is a massive intersection itself. Obviously, it serves a purpose. It's two collector roadways. Um, it is, you know, if obviously we have I-25, but in general, you know, federal and Colfax does serve, a, you know, that commercial heavy traffic uh, purpose. Um, we don't want that traffic, obviously, you know, that heavy traffic, we want that heavy traffic to stay on, on federal, on Colfax. We don't want it to go into the side streets unless it's required to go into the side streets because it's often being delivered there. Um, but we obviously, you know, for those smaller trips, for those smaller connections, A, we want to improve that mobility, um, you know, not having to hop on your car or being able to just get to stadium district when stadium districts redevelops by hopping on your car, being safe to be able to walk there or bike there, you know, if you want, if you, uh, if you can, and just feel comfortable while doing so, right? Um, obviously, topography is a huge deal in the site. Uh, we have some pretty steep changes uh, that, that are there. Um, that that need to be taken into consideration, obviously, when developing anything. Um, again, like I mentioned, stormwater, um, the, the site itself, you know, was built to accommodate um, a, a flood event. And if you see the parking structure, the, the parking lot of Stadium District, the Stadium District is sort of in that same boat where it's meant to retain water. Something huge, horrible happens, right? Um, so anything, anything type of redevelopment, basically, you know, it needs to accommodate that flow. Um, in order to not destroy whatever this ends up be getting built. Um, open space, obviously, is another, is another pre, 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 uh, pretty big requirement. That's a basic requirement for any large development plan that is out there. Um, it needs to be accessible, public, you know, open space, right? Um, you know, it cannot just be matched, you know, in, with, in edit within the neighborhood, um, and it needs to feel comfortable and, 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 and safe for people to attend. Um, obviously, we know that this intersection is absolutely probably one of the most horrible intersections ever, um, just because it's a barrier. We don't have that many, obviously, pedestrians and bicycles at directly at the intersection because it's an infrastructure barrier. So it's the intent of being able to connect people and provide those safer options uh, for pedestrians and uh, pedestrians and bicycles. And be better for you know, obviously, once we have the BRT systems running on federal and Colfax, is having you know that strong connection for that or transit system uh, can be successful here. Um, and then for the from the line use perspective, you know, it's this huge gap that we have right there. Obviously, we have the existing neighborhoods to the west, and then uh, the existing Sun Valley and the south. But we have this really uh, you know potentially redevelopment taking place in the stadium, and then the new housing and new development that's taking place in the core of Sun Valley. Uh, so it all needs to transition. It all needs to, to transition smoothly um, in order to be, you know, again, the best type of community um, that we have. And of course, from the HTP and C. You know, HTP perspective is, you know, let, let's have enough land so that it can be uh, developable parcels, right? Whoever ends up being the redeveloper for this is either HTP, Denver, or you know, God knows who. Obviously, it needs to, it, you know, it needs to be provide enough part, enough acreage so that things can redevelop there without um, having too much of a cost burden on the developer, because otherwise it's not, it's not going to redevelop. So, um, like I mentioned, you know, right now the clover leaf is a little bit of an infrastructure, not a little bit, but it's an infrastructure barrier. Um, it doesn't provide, there is no comfortable way for a pedestrian or bicycle uh, to go there. You basically, you need to be on guard 24-7. Um, and again, if you are in Villa Park and you want to just go over to Sun Valley, it's a you know you have to basically go down Villa Park. I'm so, yeah, Villa Park. Sorry, if West Colfax or Villa Park, and you want to go down to over to to, to Sun Valley Kitchen, um, you you're pretty much you know. I mean, I'm not gonna yeah. You're you're pretty much risking your life pretty much just because it's not a comfortable walk. You still have to end up in Federal Boulevard, or you have to go through Holden, which um, is pretty. Um, it's a pretty horrible intersection as well. Like I mentioned, those slopes, uh, 45 foot drop, uh, basically from the north to the south, and 70 foot drop from the west to the east. 
Um, so all of that needs to be taken into consideration. So I'm not sure whether you all knew this before, but the existing bridge, the existing bridge that is there, um, it got, you know, it got built in 2005. So it from an infrastructure um, time span, that's relatively new. Um, and basically, since um, since the discussions with uh, since the, the, with CDOT have progressed, they've been able to double check. But right now, um, that bridge, you know, it, it was built uh, through CDOT's Bridge Enterprise Fund, which means that it has to be paid back. If we don't use if it's not being used for the original intent, it needs to be paid back. And right now, that price tag is about seven and a half million dollars. Um, so that is something that we must take into consideration, um, that we must delineate in sort of that final report that we will be doing, uh, because that is something that, you know, somebody needs to pay for that bridge. Um, whether that we push it down to the developer, whether we, you know, we absorb it, see that absorbs it, or Denver absorbs it, somebody has to pay for it, right? Um, and obviously it's a depreciating value, and the chances of this getting redeveloped in the next five years, you know, let's be honest, is they're not that high. Um, so, you know, we'll see where we're at, right? When the, once this actually becomes, you know, there's a lot more like, you know, something to stand on. Um, if there's an option, obviously we do have some, uh, you know, a couple of options where the, uh, the bridge is removed. Um, we are approximating the bridge removal to be at about a million bucks. So if something happens on this on this uh, uh, 29 acres today, we're talking about nine, uh, eight and a half million bucks that we somebody has to absorb um, in order if we if we move forward with an option that takes down the bridge. Um, zoning transition, I, I kind of spoke to it a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, we have the existing neighborhoods on the one side and then we have the, the, the new redevelopment on the other. Um, some of the things that actually and Eugene will speak to this and a little, you know, a little bit in a couple of slides is, is that what we what we heard from through NPI process is, you know, let let it be a smooth transition from one to the other. Let's not have um, these high rises literally right next to, you know, the single stair family story, uh, story story home right there. And that is obviously not good practice um, for for any planning, you know, for planning of any city. So that is, you know, we kind of need to transition all of this smoothly and do we have the right zoning? What do we need to do in order to make sure that there is a, a proper, uh, that the zoning is correct uh, for any future redevelopment? And then lastly, and, and um, Doug is going to speak to this in a little bit as well. Um, we, you know, we have two BRT studies. We, we, have, we have two BRT corridors meet right here. Um, the Federal Boulevard, um, Denver Moves Federal Boulevard recently wrapped up. And we already have a clearer picture. So that wrapped up in actually at the end of la at the at the beginning of this year. So we have a much clearer picture about the uh, the proposed sort of what we're expecting, the proposed cross sections, the how the roadway is going to look, uh, how we want it, how we, all parties feel comfortable. We want it to look um, at this particular location. Um, we also have it. Obviously, this is a pretty big intersection uh, for for the future for the other future. Um, the Colfax BRT um, Federal Boulevard is probably going to come in first before the West Colfax BRT is going to come in. But either way, so we have a general, a better understanding of what our transit you know needs are for this particular intersection itself. And we have had a lot of discussions with RTD. Um, and, and Doug is going to speak about that in a little bit, like I mentioned, about sort of what is RTD looking for in this in this particular site. With that, I've spoken a lot. I'll be happy to take any questions. I don't know if we have any questions in the chat, but feel free to uh, ask away. Okay, come on, don't be shy. Put me on the spot. There are no there questions, are no questions in, the in the chat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. And I don't see any hands. All right. I am surprised, but OK. Let's continue on, shall we? So the preliminary scenarios. <laughs> um, so basically, this is what, what we believe you all left on. This is the October 2020 um, stakeholder meeting draft scenarios. This is sort of where the ones that you all picked. Basically, we have the white diamond, northbound over the bridge, um, and then Parkway over the bridge. So these are these are the three. Am I correct? Are we correct? 
All right, but yeah, quiet group. I am not quiet on group. unsighted, okay. you know, scenarios here. All righty. So basically, like, and you know, we uh, the team basically analyzed it again against your uh, against the framework values um, that we all said at the you know at this early stages of this process back in July. Now, what has happened? Pretty much um, a little bit since since then, um, and I'll and I'll start with sort of that dotty you know with the dotty perspective. So um, and this is what you know when Eileen was still here, um, you all selected the three. And basically at that point, point um, Eileen um, and the, the core team here basically went to Dotty leadership and, and presented, you know, sort of the findings where we're at on this project. Um, and in all honesty, you know, Dotty leadership was like, we can do better. We can do better in this process. Um, let's not, uh, you know, this is a, again, this is sort of like that, let, let's, a visioning process of like what we really want to achieve here and how could this truly be transformational. And so um, let's not short ourselves out um, of any opportunities that we have to really be able to transform this area. Um, one of the things at this point, you know, that's where um, the second Dotty leadership that we had, I was part of it. And at that point, it was the concept of um, you know, if we're seeing that br the, the bridge, the existing federal boulevard, federal boulevard bridge um, overpass uh, as a barrier because it's, it, you know, it doesn't meet, it doesn't allow us to achieve the other goals um, the, of the framework vision, and it's only going to cost, you know, in our terms, seven and a half million dollars of a depreciating value. It's really not that high of a price tag to take it, you know, to, to absorb. Um, especially if this gets redeveloped in 10 years and maybe that price tag is three and a half million. It's still probably going to be, you know, at that point, one and a half million to take it down. But let's not let, let's not short ourselves um, of achieving the other goals um, because we, you know, because of uh, we want to maintain that bridge. Um, and so that was sort of those internal discussions that we had. Um, unfortunately, our CDOT friends were not able to join us. Um, and so we also had several meetings with with CDOT and with CDOT leadership um, about sort of the options um, that that we have. And you know, from CDOT's perspective, you know, the, our efforts, you know, need to accommodate, you know, the the, the safety traffic goals uh, that CDOT has as an agency. Um, some of the concerns is that obviously is that we are not, you know, this effort is not taking is not going the next mile of really analyzing the level of impact at full traffic uh, impact analysis of like what these options could be but it, it does need to be taken into consideration with any scenarios or sort of that that we're putting forward this is their property at the end of the day um, this is not something that denver can control it is up to them and so um, they have to figure you know they have their own um, the, as an agency they have their own goals that they need to satisfy um, further, obviously, because of this, further analysis does is needed. Um, where we stand today is further analysis is needed um, to analyze really um, a trans, you know, how these scenarios uh, fit a transportation system for all modes. Um, again, sort of the whole concept of like it, it is a it, it, it is an arterial. Sorry, it's not a collector like I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. It's, an, it's like no, oh my God, it's an arterial. Never mind, it just got switched. Um, so, and there is a, there is an intent and purpose, and so obviously we do need to analyze those impacts. Um, of what could happen to traffic um, and, and, you know, by, by doing the white diamond or anything along those lines. And then, the, you know, one of their biggest concerns and um, it, there needs to be an option out there that does retain a portion of the state highway um, on the bridge itself. Um, you know, right now, seven and a half million, obviously it, 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 is, it, it is decent amount of money um get, you know we don't know where we're going to be in a in a few years um but if there if we cannot absorb it for whatever reason whoever cannot absorb it then let's make sure that there's an option out there that could work that still potentially meet or halfway meet the other goals uh but doesn't cost it's not that cost prohibitive that we you know um for the overall and then lastly you know to sort of address the the, the issues of like okay this needs to be a little bit more robust um, HTP um, is going to look into being able to use the next phase, that 500K uh, that they have um, for the next phase of this effort um, into conducting those analysis that, that CDOT is looking for. Um, so that next phase, it was a little bit more geared to be towards the like, market analysis. Uh, there, there needs to be that analysis of um, market value 
Um, CDOT has to, if they sell this property, they have to sell it at a market rate. And, um, but in order to sell at a market rate, we also kind of need to understand, you know, what, a, what is an actual feasible option out there that meets, um, that meets CTD's goals and CDOT's goals. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to kick it over to Doug to, to speak about RTD's um, efforts or what do they envision here? Sure. Uh, so the Colfax corridor and the federal corridor are two of the busiest corridors in the RTD system. Um, this, the, the uh, Cloverleaf, the Colfax and federal interchange has long been a barrier to uh, efficient transit, I guess, operation and use within the area. Um, just because there's there's no clear way to transfer between the routes. Um, for years, there was a transfer point over at uh, over at 14th Avenue on the west side of uh, this area, um, and then RTD opened a transfer center on the which is in the northeast uh, quadrant of the current interchange, uh, and then that was in use until the W line opened in 2013, uh, when everything's taking place down at Decatur Federal Station now. But the the overall layout of uh, of the street network and having the interchange and the Colfax viaduct and uh, it, it's just a, a lot of challenges to efficiently moving the buses around there and uh, they have they have to do some pretty big loops uh, out of direction to to get going the right direction again out there uh, after after pa or after you know picking up and dropping off passengers to to make their connections in that area so one of the things that that RTD hopes to get out of this is is a more connected street network uh, that'll allow the buses to move through there uh, much more easily and allow much better and, and safer connections between the routes in that area. Um, as Gabby mentioned earlier, this is this is also at the intersection of two uh, BRT cor or two future BRT corridors on Federal and Colfax, um, and they they would still be planned to meet uh, where where they cross and hopefully have a better uh, connection to to actually do that where passengers can actually uh, efficiently transfer between the two lines. Um, and then uh, another big one is is looking at safety improvements at Federal and Howard. Um, right now, that's um, where a lot of the transfers take place between uh, Decatur Federal Station, between the uh, the Colfax and Federal buses. And uh, there have been a number of, of incidents of pedestrians getting hit crossing the street there, um, just uh, a lot uh, to do with the, uh, I guess, the safety of the, the interchange itself, because you have vehicles coming on and off of it that don't have traffic signals, um, limited sight distance uh, looking over the bridge and things like that, that uh, combine to, to make it a, a less than ideal situation for uh, passengers transferring, but also pa also people who, you know, walk to and from the station that live at the apartments on the west side of Federal as well. So uh, we hope to, hope to see some uh, improvement to that situation as uh, the opportunity to, to redevelop the interchange comes about. I am on mute as always. Thank okay. you, Doug. I appreciate that. Um, then um, I don't know if we have, I don't believe we have somebody from our Parks and Rec team, um, right? OK, so our discussions are one on one discussions with parks. Um, like I mentioned a, a little bit earlier today, for any type of large redevelopment, um, the minimum that any large uh, any large developer could, um, needs to basically, um, you know, have for an accessible park is 10 percent of developable land and developable land. That's kind of key um, on this. So um, especially in this site, because the slopes and everything else. Um, so that is sort of that baseline minimum, um, and it needs to be accessible for the community. That's another very strong key point um, here. And um, one of the things, because one of the uh, questions out there was that we had that there was, again, trying to be transformational. Some of the options that were put out there um, is can we do, you know, should this be a, you know, a, a more quantifiable, like significant park? Um, DPR was like, nope. We do not need a re another regional significant park in this area because we do have Paco Sanchez, you know, just to the south of this. Um, but it does need to have, you know, what DPR is looking for is what's lo was looking for. Um, again, is that accessible bigger than, you know, than obviously that me that meets a little bit above that threshold of 10 percent um, that is, you know, that is significant 
that is unique uh, for the area that can work with the slopes uh, and, and so forth. Um, and they're very much open to that flexible park space um, that you know several other cities and in some areas here of of, of our city of our own city. You know we are we're now playing around with. Um, if you guys have uh, if you guys can uh, go up to uh, Westminster uh, the Westminster Park over in seventy the seventy second uh, the B line the first uh, it, the the B line station park um, up in Westminster like that is a really good example of how it can be a park and a stormwater facility um, all in one and it's extremely open, it's fun to be there, um, it's a nature play, it's it's a whole bunch, but basically that that's sort of what they're looking for um, in, in general, something that is definitely more, um, that they're open to something that is more flexible, that can be that can be a unique asset to the you know to the entire to, to the four basically to the four neighborhoods sort of established the new neighborhoods that are coming the the new neighborhoods still in stadium district but not neighborhood but the new redevelopment sun valley uh west colfax villa and then sloan's um and then i'm going to quick it over to mr eugene who's going to talk about uh, cpd's sort of goals and, and vision for this Thank you, Gabby. Uh, so uh, again, Eugene Howard with uh, Community Planning and Development. And for those who aren't aware, uh, Community Planning and Development uh, has been in the community uh, within this area for really the last two years, developing a, an area plan under our neighborhood planning initiative. Uh, and through that process, and um, I'm glad to say that uh, being involved in this uh, Cloverleaf project, as well as uh, leading our planning effort, uh, the values and the issues that are important to the community, there's a great deal of overlap. Um, one of the primary things that we've learned and heard and has been uh, substantiated through our planning effort in the land use side is the are the issues related to safety, comfort, and individuals' abilities to get from the west side in the west neighborhoods across to uh, the Decatur Federal Station, for example, and the businesses and the and the and jobs and employment that are on the east side of Federal. Uh, and we've learned, uh, and we've already we knew beforehand, but we've learned through this process just how much of a barrier Federal Boulevard can be, uh, some of the challenges in getting across uh, that, uh, that facility. And then of course the Cloverleaf, which really was built and meant for cars and really wasn't built for people, whether they be walking, riding bikes, or even uh, using assisted devices to, to move around in the area. Uh, and so one of the key things that we really hope can come out of this effort is an attention to detail around the pedestrian experience and improving uh, safety and security and comfort for people who will want to move around within this area. Uh, the area as it exists today, as well as taking advantage of some of the new opportunities that new development will bring. And so that's really our, our primary number one concern uh, to see addressed through this opportunity. Uh, again, uh, having access to the jobs and employment that we imagine will come with new development, as well as supporting uh, the residential development that's taking place within Sun Valley and the future redevelopment of West Ridge Homes, and the really exciting projects that can come out of the Stadium District Master Plan, and then further north with uh, River Mile development. So there's a lot of energy in this place right now, and this uh, opportunity with the Cloverleaf is yet another opportunity to see this area transform, but transform for the residents who are here today. Uh, another key issue uh, that we've learned and heard a lot about through this process is around, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, environmental justice. Uh, you know, we've learned a lot as a society over the last 50 to 75 years with the automobile. Um, mostly it's been good in providing access to opportunities uh, and giving people the freedom of movement for those who have, are able to take advantage of a, uh, of a vehicle. And fast forward 75 years, we now know some of the issues and challenges with pollution and the separation of communities that our roadway infrastructure has, uh, has created in some, in some cases. So we have a huge opportunity to really reimagine this place 
um, reintroduce a grid system and a grid network that can help sort of distribute some of the local traffic uh, while um, not necessarily impacting regional movement. Uh, we have an opportunity to introduce the parks, the open spaces, manage stormwater drainage, improve and increase you know, pedestrian safety, and all in line with the values that uh, came out of your process, as well as the process that we've engaged with. So I don't want to take up too much time, um, but really feel that this is a huge opportunity, a once in a lifetime. And so I really hope that we uh, collectively can work together and move this project forward uh, so that we are balancing the needs of our, our CDOT and, and, and the movement of uh, goods and cars, but also really truly lend the priority to human safety, people moving around uh, and the ways that they choose to move around and really look for opportunities to stitch and knit this part of our city uh, more cohesively back together. And so I just would say, uh, let's uh, keep that at the forefront safety, the environmental issues and opportunities to right some of those um, and really create a great place that everyone of every ability and every station in life can benefit from. Thanks. Thank you, Eugene. You always, always pump me up. I love it. The way that you speak is like so awesome. Um, and then I'm actually, voting, Nancy. Ooh. I'm voting for Eugene. <laughs> At a campaign speech, I'm I'm with him. Yeah. Eugene, 2021. There you go. <laughs> um, and then uh, Miss Miss Nancy, <laughs> um, who's gonna the for the, the the private developers? We had the one on one. Our consultant team had the one on one. So I'm not sure who yes. we're gonna kick it off to. Um, I'll go ahead and take it. Arlene is up in the mountains, and so her uh, internet is well. <laughs> Not good, but uh, we did have a, after we presented the, um, those draw scenarios uh, to this group back in October, then we met with some private developers. Once again, going back to Gabby's point of, we have to have developable, developable parcels for this project to work. Um, and so these were ones who are knowledgeable uh, about the area. They had one good thing is a general agreement about the attractiveness for the area for not only development, but also affordable housing we know how important that is to the community. Um, they did view the bridge as an asset and a potential connector, thinking about, hey, maybe the views, if we use it or repurposed it as you know, pedestrian facility, views from there um, as a potential connector. Um, you know, but they also acknowledge too that the grades that Gabby talked about earlier may, um, may have a detraction to the results that we wanted. Uh, it was also agreed that the east side was more developable than the west, and you'll see in something that we present later that we've moved some of the main roadways around to account for that. Uh, we also talked about staggering the heights um, with higher uh, buildings on the west and lower on the east for views. This would also tie into uh, the stadium district and some of the things that they're thinking about from the zoning standpoint. Um, and then they also reiterated it was very important to have that connection to Conejos and also from the Northwest neighborhoods down to the South um, East and Sun Valley. Um, they also viewed that as important as you all did. And so it just helped us uh, clarify a few things um, when we were going through these scenarios. So that, that was the uh, kind of the synopsis of the discussion we had with the developers. Sweet, thank you, Nancy. And I, know I, saw, I saw a question from, from Jean on the chat. Um, I thought I saw. Yeah, she asked who would maintain the park and the stormwater facilities, Gabby. So um, who would maintain it, um, DPR and our stormwater folks? It all depends on the type of facility, right, um, that we would have out there. If it's green infrastructure, um, you know, it requires a different level of, of, of infrastructure improvements uh, for, most, for, for the most part. Um, it would be probably maintained by the city. Now, if it becomes some form of special district, then that's obviously a different story. Um, but it, in order to be, it, it, because it needs to be public, um, uh, then it's a concept of, of DPR absorbing that maintenance. And then Ms. And then Jill, oh, yes, go ahead. First of all, I want to say, Gabby, you and your fellow presenters are doing an amazing job <laughs> summarizing the history of how this project has evolved and all the different players and their perspectives. So thank you for laying that out so clearly. Uh, I, this did raise a couple questions for me. 
I, it, you know, it was an interesting the contrast between Dottie saying the cost of removing the bridge should not hinder the vision, and then CDOT saying we have to include a, a scenario with the bridge. And so it just makes me wonder if there has been any discussion about devolution and what role that might play and how this area could evolve. And then my second question was about the 10% the of developable land must be allocated towards the park. That, that was a requirement I was just wasn't familiar with. So I was curious where that came from. Is that in Denver zoning code or, or where does that come from? So the 10% is part of the, the, the large redevelopment process. Um, that it, I'm not sure if it, it's, uh, Eugene, you may need to help me on this one. I don't know if it's, a, if it's officially part of a code, um, but in the, in the LDR process, um, when we do, for example, for stadium district, actually for Loretto Heights, um, that has been sort of that baseline condition. I don't know if Eugene, if you, if you can help me out on that one. And so I believe the question was about LDR, is that correct? In the requirements yeah. for open space? Correct. So my understanding, uh, we did have uh, prior to the large development review process uh, kicking in uh, any development, and this is again dated information, but any development that I believe was, uh, I think it, the measure was five or 10 acres and greater had a requirement. And I think the requirement is 10% uh, open space. And so we have retained the requirement for open space. We just shrunk the size of development that would trigger this kind of review. So generally speaking, any development that's five acres or, or, or larger uh, would require uh, at least a, an initial large development review analysis to see if LDR would be appropriate to help uh, understand and outline infrastructure needs, other needs, including open space um, for any project. And so, uh, yes, there is an open space requirement. I believe the percentage is 10% of the overall area. Uh, and through working with that project and through that review, we would look to determine, you know, who owns it, who maintains it, what kind of open space, and, and get into the details of that. But that is, in fact, what the LDR is meant to do, is to help understand and outline the requirements for any particular individual project. Thank you, Eugene. Um, and then for your first question, I jumped to the second one because you know it's a it's a little bit more it's a little bit harder to 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 discuss. Um, it the last thing that you know basically Dottie leadership um, at this point does not want to assume any level of devolution taking place um, for this vision study. We should not be assuming that, which is one of the reasons why basically. You know, we seem very at odd, right, with CDOT. And the original concept of going down to one, it was clearly not going to work because we want to be transformational enough um, to obviously to be able to to really bring something new, something uh, something different, uh, something better to to this area. But then obviously we still have the, the, that existing foundation that it is CDOT's property and it is CDOT's roads um, here. So. At this point, we cannot assume that devolution will take place, uh, but uh, but there is, I don't know, Nevid, you want to jump, I saw that you jumped out, you know, you put your the camera back on. Um, that is from Dottie's side of things. Um, we are not allowed to think that we, that, that we can devolve this particular site right now, um, but that's why we kind of need to figure out different scenarios. So from the mayor's office. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I think it's, it, an excellent question, and it's a little premature. Yeah. So you know the, the if if we figure out a way to transform the 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 interchange, transform the cloverleaf into a bunch of local streets, is CDOT really going to own you know like the extension of Grove Street or Elliott? I mean that that would make no sense. Those would probably be city streets. Um, whether or not the the whole 30 acres is devolved to the city and county, you know, how important is that to CDOT? And you know, how does that go into the calculus of how all these pieces are sort of put into play? So I think the 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 answer is we don't know, which is exactly what Gabby said in three words. 
Um, but it's the right question, and I think we'll 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 get to that question um, when we get when we interrogate the marketplace about what can actually happen here. Thanks, Mark. Can be up, sorry. Um, and then we also have a question from Gene on the chat. Can you explain devolution? Uh, so Gene, devolution. So right now the federal and Colfax are actually um, owned by CDOT. So basically um, resurfacing um, any large scale projects that take place on um, on, on, on federal um, usually is gets paid for by by CDOT. That also means that the, that roadway, the, any roadways that is owned by the, the Colorado Department of Transportation need to meet the Colorado transportation standards. So hence the reason why you see, you know, we, why you see federal being federal today. Um, obviously, back in the day, it, you know, it was it was a little bit different the, the landscape land uses around the area. Things have progressed. And so the concept of devolution is basically um, the city absorbing the maintenance cost um, of of that roadway um, completely. So resurfacing new traffic signals, um, ADA curb ramps, um, any you know potholes that happen in the area um, is basically then all of that maintenance cost it gets absorbed by the city. Um, but usually, what needs to happen at that point is is that usually the cities, you know, the cities don't want to absorb. A, a really large roadway that has all of these issues and it's not built to the city standards. So that's where the negotiation sort of needs to take place between the two agencies um, about, okay, you know, upgrade, you know, CDOT spend the, or somebody spend the money now, upgrade that roadway to the city standards, and then we can absorb it. And then because then that's something that we are able to absorb because it meets the city, that city standards. And this is for any city, basically Federal Boulevard, even up um, on Federal Heights and, you know, Westminster, the, down to Sheridan, Littleton. Um, so that's sort of that, the, that's what that devolution process sort of in, entails. Um, Ms. Jill, you still have your hand up, and so I'm not sure if that was lingering from before or you have another question. Nope, okay. <laughs> no more questions, sorry. All right, anybody has any more questions? So we are at 6.30 and I think we only have like 30 minutes. And I mean, I knew this was gonna be a very long meeting. Um, I think we left it all the way until seven, but any any other questions? All right, let's get to the fun part, shall we? Okay, so based on all of these discussions that we had, um, basically, again, you know, these are, you know, these are the draft scenarios uh, that, that you saw. These are sort of where we are at today. So let's go through sort of each one of them. Uh, white diamond. So on the original sort of white diamond, you know, the white diamond could be in theory, uh, have the bridge or not have the bridge. Obviously, like we mentioned before, um, the, the bridge means it eats up that developable land and it um, impacts basically that flexible park space that it, this site could have. If there's an option that brings down the bridge, then you know this could be you know this could be up. This could basically this could be an, an, an estimated. Um, the the benefits of it, you know we establish a little of the pros and cons. Um, you're gonna see them to the right of your screen. This one gives you about 13 acres of developable land, um, about 3.4 acres of that flexible open space, that stormwater flexible open space, and obviously it definitely meets because it's a 3.4. It definitely meets that 10 min, 10 percent minimum of of um, 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 of park space requirement. Um, the one way, basically, the concept of obviously like one way couplets, it splits up and then picks up right back up at the north. Which then that means obviously that the intersections of Federal and Colfax are a lot smaller than we, if you have a traditional intersection. Um, we because we take down that bridge, um, basically we are able to reestablish that grid. Um, which is again that meets some of that of those original goals, those original purposes of the framework that you all establish. Um, and then things because obviously we can regrade the entire site. It's not going to be completely flat because we're not in Florida. Um, but basically, that the, being able to flatten out the land allows that greater connectivity, um, allows that easier movements that we don't have to build like two-story buildings um, with two entrances and, and so forth. Um, we don't have to. Um, pipe stormwater, 
which again is one of our is, you know, Dottie's is one of those, you know, very strong baselines. We're trying not to pipe our stormwater infrastructure because that's how we have ended up where we are today. We keep hiding problems underneath our ground um, and we need it to be more, uh, more, more sustainable, you know, more natural flow. So that's where you you find uh, actually, uh, yeah, you can see it. So you can, you know, we have this, this connection. And that again, because it's flexible, it can be park space and it can create that trail connection down to Lakewood Gulch. And uh, for, you know, for the most part, it can meet um, the sort of that stadium district sort of existing, you know, the proposed roads for a stadium district. Um, just to call out, if you guys need a visual of what um, RTD is looking for, one of those crucial things that RTD is looking for. So for, can you go see, see my, uh, my, my mouse, my cursor? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. So um, you are, you know, you're on the bus, you're coming, you're going, you're going westbound. What RTD is looking for is basically being able to turn uh, somewhere before sort of the, the major intersections um, and being able to come down um, and then hit Decatur, uh, the, the Decatur Federal Station right over here. So from the east, that's one of those crucial points that, you know, that they're looking for instead of having to deal with the big intersection at Federal and Colfax. Um, is being able to come down this way. Um, now, some of the cons for this one is, is that um, obviously for transit itself, if you are on the 31 um, and you have one way couplets, obviously we need to make that one stop, one that one, and this is, sorry, and this, this left turn thing is just for those local buses. It's not going to be for the BRTs. So where the, where the BRTs actually meet, it's a little bit tricky on one way couplets, but again, you know, we can be innovative. God knows where we're going to land, you know, when it comes to our infrastructure system in a few years. Um, but basically what we need is to have that single point, um, uh, what is the bus stop for both BRT systems, whether that is on the, e on the east or on the west. But that means basically that somehow if you, if, you know, if we have that one single bus stop uh, for the BRT systems um, on the east side, that means that the southbound um, BR, federal BRT needs to cross over and come this way. So it's a little bit tricky. That's those are one of the cons that we have. The other one is that that Conejos connection to Stadium District to Elliott Stadium District is not direct. I uh, cannot be direct. So obviously that is something that that we need to, to consider. Um, and then for a lot of these, um, there isn't going to be a traffic signal, and more than likely we're going to have to put some form of median. So it's going to be right in, right out. Uh, type of efforts um, in these local streets. So obviously that needs to be considered at the next step. Um, and um, I see Jean's, uh, Jean, you have your hand up. Feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Oh, I think Sorry, Jean I didn't mean to have it up. <laughs> oh, okay. So do we, um, do you want me to, because I mean, hopefully, do you want me to go people through all of these right now or like I don't discuss sort of each one? Uh, Gabby, I think there's so much info related to it. It'd be nice if there were questions right now, we would okay. take them. But okay. um, aside from Jean's hand, which she doesn't, didn't mean to have up, does anyone else have any questions? All right. So Hi. <laughs> sweet. Let's go to the next one then. All right, so um, this is D, northbound over the bridge. Again, sort of that's one of CDOT's desires is to let's have an option out there that does utilize the bridge uh, as a state highway. That's sort of that key component it needs to be used as a state highway. So yes, we can have, you know, obviously again in the white diamond, if we keep the bridge, we can have a local street, but at that point we will still need to pay CDOT back, uh, bridge enterprise back for that bridge. So we need to keep it as a state highway. Um, so on this, you know, again, we need to, um, on this side, um, the alignment of federal, whether it's northbound on the bridge or southbound on the bridge, that still sort of can still be analyzed at that next future phase. But the core concept is, you know, basically keeping a state highway on a level of the state highway on the bridge. So this one, again, still provides, you know, about, you know, 13 acres of developable land. Um, it can provide about five acres of, of, of plant open space. Um, in this one, it would more than likely not be that flexible open space 
because um, water does not go up. And so at this point, if you take a look, we will need to have a bridge over Conejos, over Federal Boulevard, uh, which means if you remember, I don't think, I'm sorry, I didn't think I'd include it, but we have the water, the stormwater flow comes from Conejos and it comes from North Federal section. So all of this area would need to be piped. Um, obviously it will land, one of the landing sites will be here, but obviously that is, you know, we. It, it may not be the best park space available through there, um, but for stormwater, obviously we need to pipe it all the way up here in order to continue to flow. And this is where it would be a little bit better, you know, that park space where the flexibility potentially could come in. Um, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this scenario, um, Elliot from Stadium District, we would have that local street connectivity on Conejos uh, to, uh, to the future Elliot for Stadium District. Um, however, it would not provide, if you take a look, that arts, that uh, access that RTD really desires uh, to access the uh, federal Decatur station for the local buses coming from the east. Um, then, um, and so, you know, this is, the, you know, this is one of the, one of those options. Um, the intersection, one of the benefits of splitting is a little bit the same thing as splitting in the split, in the, in the split couplet. That intersection of federal, the one-legged intersection of federal and Colfax would be a lot smaller than the traditional scenario, than the traditional intersections that you see around the city today. Um, and we kind of established a little bit of that, that grid network um, uh, pattern through here. So this is um, in, sorry, and then the other thing, one of the, one of the major sort of uh, hesitations obviously on this one again is the, the transit stop the brt transit stops where would it land um and then that connection basically we might run into the same issue of that connection um on pedestrian and bicycle connection on federal um connecting the two roadways if you are walking on west colfax you know um and you want to be able to reach up here then you know how do you do that when there's like the some pretty significant slopes we still have to deal with significant slopes here so questions, comments. Hey, Gabby, Jill had a question about using vehicular LOS to evaluate these scenarios. Um, that information, Jill, is on there. It's just informational. Um, we're not necessarily looking at LOS as a criteria, um, traffic and then also pedestrian and transit uh, levels of service will be considered in more detail in the next phase of the study. But we are looking at, as Gabby has said, we are looking at the overall connectivity and mobility, especially for um, other phases or other modes of traffic, sorry. Yeah, um, and you're right. So those are sort of those requirements that uh, that, that CDAR wants, wants to, to look at, um, and they'll be looking at traffic LOS. Um, and hopefully we can, I, I think we can certainly convince them of looking you know, at, at pedestrian, at least at and, and minimum pedestrian level. Um, that LOS, uh, because that's a little bit more robust nationwide than bicycle um, LOS. But I think where, where we analyze whether this is a thumbs up, medium down, is basically how does that grid network look? Um, you know, it, do, do somebody as a pedestrian has multiple access points um, to a particular corner, um, rather, and then what are, the, what are the hindrances that they have to encounter um, for this? Um, so, this, that's definitely one of the things that you will see in our matrix um, that we're looking into. Any other questions, comments? All right, so option E, the one that, that, that you saw, Parkway over the bridge. This is also uh, sort of uh, the, the also known as the Western Swing that the West Colfax bids uh, developed um, through their process. Um, this one, based again on those requirements, that baseline condition requirements that, that we need to have, pro can provide us about, about close to 14 acres of developable land. Um, it maintains the bridge, but it maintains it as a local street, so we would have to pay that, that bridge back no matter what. Um, it, does, it does not provide, um, you know, th this is the second highest developable land opportunity. Um, but it actually doesn't provide that that grade of accessible park space and the flexible park space um, concept as well. So similar elements to the similar issues to the previous one, because we're keeping that bridge, is um, basically we're not able to regrade the site. So stormwater needs to be piped. 
Um, you know, we have the, you know, the retention areas over here. And because we're not grading it, we're not grading the, you know, the site. Um, at this point, we are not sure whether we can provide that Conejos connectivity down to, to this uh, proposed Elliot for Stadium District. Um, again, sort of, uh, you know, a little bit, you know, we, we still need to figure out, obviously, hopefully, um, actually, no, we won't be able to, RTD won't be able to access uh, because of the slopes, the, the, the connection down here. Um, and there will be another bridge. So in this one, it will be sort of two general bridges over here. But it does one of the one of the biggest issues um, on this one. Again, Eugene kind of spoke to it a little bit as well. Is that equity factor is swinging the entire intersection to the west to the entire to uh, to the established neighborhoods? It, you know, obviously, which costs an infrastructure barrier plus pollution plus noise pollution and, and so forth. And so what the the CPD team has heard through the MPI process. Is is that's not desirable. Um, so, and it still doesn't. You know, obviously, you know, with the, the with the private developer, you know, obviously we could have some form of connection, establish some form of internal grid network, but at this point, it's it's not an easy. Yes, we can do it. Um, yes, the private sector will be able to do it when they redevelop. Um, you know, this this site. So, um, questions uh, with this one, comments. Uh, nothing in the chat, Gabby. All right. I, th this is Eugene. I guess I do have one question, uh, uh, and this is really for the community members uh, and stakeholders online. If there are any, and we don't have to take up time right now, but if there are for any of these scenarios, particularly for those of you who are connected to the West Area process as well, um, if you have any thoughts or or um, you know, feedback you'd like to share to Gabby and myself on any of these scenarios, please uh, let us know because we are wanting to make sure that both of these projects are reflecting what we've individually heard and collectively heard through our processes. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, can I say something? Jean Granville? Yeah, I, Jean. Yeah, I just hope that this is shared with a broader audience than just the few people that were able to attend tonight from the community. Um, because I would think that a lot of the folks that are involved in the West Area Plan, as well as some of the constituents with the uh, bids, would really like to um, view this. I think that you're really um, articulating and laying out um, the various scenarios and, and pros and cons in, in a, I guess, as clear a way as we can um, understand at this point. And so it just, uh, you know, I, I, I actually kind of like that there is, well, maybe I wish there would have been one clear, obvious scenario that works the best, but right. I do like that you've analyzed all of them because I think that's important for people to be able to see why maybe an initial preference doesn't end up to be their final preference. Right. Um, and we still have one more, so. <laughs> yeah. But I appreciate that, yeah. and. Um, and if and I guess you know just uh, if you need me to present in any in any way shape or form to any group, please let me know because uh, we you know obviously with Eugene we can certainly work on presenting this to to the NPI stakeholders um, or in any other process that they have. But if you know I would be happy to present to any any other groups that we have not uh, been able. And obviously this meeting is being recorded. We will post it on on our YouTube page on the Dotty YouTube page. So we will send out a link for that. But thank you, Gene. And then sort of that last one. So this one, if you remember the October in, in the October meetings that you all left off, it was down, you know, you, you selected three. Um, and basically that's when we went back to Dotty leadership and Dotty leadership is you can do better. Um, and then basically it's like, okay, how can we do better? So this is our effort at trying to trying to put out an option that you know it it you know it provides a really strong grid network and it's basically back to neighborhood connection uh, to the lab you know to the very last one that you have but obviously with more data more information uh, for everybody so on this one um as you can see obviously we take down the bridge um we have that flexible park space a little bit closer to the existing communities that we have 
uh, to the west because again we we have Lakewood Gulch and the stadium district is redeveloping. You know, hopefully we'll we'll create this really amazing park space uh, to the west of this. And so let's you know let's bring you know sort of let's try to connect all of these really great pieces together. Um, obviously it catches because it's a flexible park space. It catches the flow of stormwater from Conejos. Um, we would probably have to pipe it from the north federal site, but, but we would also have this sort of retention area to the north. Um, and then again, we can grade everything down um, and um, being able to provide, you know, that trail connection, that really strong trail connection all the way down to the Lakewood Gulch, uh, to the Lakewood Gulch area. So um, on this one, um, you know, RTD would have the opportunity to basically come east uh, down to the Decatur Transit Station. And um, because redevelopment, you know, basically we would create this park space, it gives us potentially the opportunity um, to really, um, you know, reconfigure, uh, address the, the Decatur, uh, sorry, Federal Howard um, intersection itself, because all of this is sort of being that the redevelopment. For the BRT purposes, obviously it would be easy to establish that single point connection for both BRT systems. Um, so some of the drawbacks, obviously, removal of the bridge. That's obviously a given uh, for this one. The other one is that we would be creating a pretty big intersection, at grade intersection at Federal and Colfax. Again, this is based on the cross sections that have been, um, you know, the concept cross sections that have been okayed by through the Federal um, BRT analysis uh, that we just wrapped up earlier this year. Obviously, those could change, but at this point, that is what we have to sort of go by at. Um, so that is one of the big drawbacks. Think about you know, the big outgrade intersection, um, Alameda and Federal, for example. Like that's the first one that sort of comes into my head. Um, it's a pretty big intersection itself. And so that's one of the obviously the biggest drawbacks that, that we will have here. Um, and obviously, we do have an increase of you know of general conflict points, obviously, because we're establishing that grid, grid network for you know for pedestrians, bicyclists, um, and so forth. Um, however, this one uh, this actually gives you the most opportunity for developable land, um, and obviously it has a really good um, 5.6 acres of flexible park space, which definitely sort of checks the mark. Um, and obviously, based on the you know the basic level of synchro. Um, obviously, it would be, you know, it would be like a traditional intersection um, that, that we see today with the expected numbers um, of, of traffic um, that we're expecting to see in the, in the Denver region. So with that, those are the four that basically we have narrowed it down to at this point. Um, again, I don't know if we're going to be able to narrow it down even further than that um, based on sort of the general discussions and trying to meet the, the best attainable goal for to meet the vision of the framework and our partners um, um, out there. So with that, please, uh, let's have a discussion um, about all of this lovely stuff. Ms. I'm going to go to Jill since I see her first. Oh, you're on mute, Jill. Sorry, I'm still a little fixated on the, the level of service measurement and you know can't help but notice this one has one of the lower grades and higher delays that are forecast um, and part of my problem with that measurement is it assumes that we want cars to go as fast as possible through this corridor and any delay is therefore bad but we all know speeding is the major problem on federal boulevard and actually making cars go slower down this corridor would make it faster and so I, I'm just wondering what metrics we can be looking at that get at the potential safety benefits of these different options by actually slowing traffic, not helping it go as fast as possible through the corridor. And I don't think that we're looking at LOSF as a negative, Jill, by any stretch of the imagination. I think, well, from I know that from the dotty side of things, you know, we are going, Federal Boulevard is going to get to a D or F whether we do anything in this corridor or not, you know, whether, you know, 2040 numbers are showing Federal Boulevard and call this intersection being um, uh, at a D um, or, uh, or or pretty darn bad, let's just say that. So whether we redevelop this or not, it's, it's going to get bad. And um, from Dottie's perspective, okay, let it, that's okay. That's okay to let it, to let it go bad. Um, because again, we, you know, we we no longer you know measure 
Um, you know, we know that that, you know, the fast feeds, obviously, aside from Vision Zero, causing the level of, of accidents, um, providing unsafe environments is, you know, it doesn't help for economic vitality. It doesn't help, you know, to create that sense of community, of healthy communities, healthier access to parks and services, blah, 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 blah. So, um, but it is, obviously, it is a measure that we do have to put out there. Um, but you're right, we do need to figure out a way of, of establishing, and not just for this project, but pretty much for nationwide, that, that you know, a strong, you know, that equal amount of pedestrian level of service um, that is taken as seriously as traffic, as, as vehicle LOS, right? Um, and, you know, we do have to, we do have to, you know, counter that, you know, obviously by establishing the grid network, there is going to be more locations where those conflict points that occur. But the issue is, is that those conflict points, you know, right now when there is a conflict point, it leads to more than likely to a serious injury or a fatality. So if, you know, if we're establishing, we're establishing the grid and those conflict points come in, but you know what, it's just a close call, then we need to figure out a way to put a value to that. Um, so that's, you, I think our practice in general needs to evolve to a better service of LOS. Um, I see Ms. Um, Ms. Torres, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Gabby. Um, one of the things that I'm wondering about, and um, you mentioned it earlier, is kind of looking at the Alameda and uh, federal intersection and knowing how intense it is and um, the number of um, car crashes uh, that it, that occur at that intersection and other accidents. I'm just wondering if, if you were able to recreate an intersection like that, what would you do differently if we've got this opportunity to think about this a little bit differently? Um, just curious what, what, what you think about in relation to this neighborhood connection model. Is that a Gabby, personal Gabby question? <laughs> I'd love, I mean, Gabby, Jill, I mean, I, I imagine a lot of folks have thought about it's, that. Yeah. It's basically, in all honesty, is us being able as Dottie be, it, that's where the devolution question kicks in. Um, because we do have to right now go by the cross section that, um, that CDOT also approves. And so at this particular location, based on the federal, Denver Moves Federal, the BRT AA alternative analysis that we just wrapped up, um, the concept plans that CDOT feels comfortable with um, is basically two general travel lanes and then one dedicated BRT lane on each side, on each, on each way. Um, which at that point, you know, because it's still federal and it does carry that heavier vehicle, um, travel lanes, you know, the minimum, the minimum needs to be, um, 12, maybe we can shrink it down to, uh, to basically, um, 11, but at which point it still puts us at minimum 66, it's closer, it's, it's closer to a hundred foot intersection, um, uh, that somebody, a pedestrian needs to cross because we also need to account for turn lanes, which, you know, we have two, we need two turn lanes on, you know, because we're, again, it's, you know, it's a, it's a different mentality. Um, it's still that old school mentality of like, how can we move cars faster? Um, but all of that is, you know, again, it come, it does come down to uh, whose standards do we have to follow? Um, and, um, and hopefully there's some progress once, you know, this actually comes to fruition uh, on whether, whether that is, you know, the, the different standards uh, continue to evolve. I don't know, Jill, if you have a, since you are definitely knowledgeable on uh, envisioning and trying to figure out how can we solve this puzzle, what would you recommend? Yeah, I think the real opportunity here is the BRT because how do you move a lot of people down a corridor safely? It's by getting them out of cars and into transit. And so as much as we can focus on coming up with a solution that is, really oriented around BRT, then that's going to allow us to shrink more and more of the space for vehicles, which is in turn going to make it safer for pedestrians and, and everybody along the corridor. And Gabby, you hit it on the head too, whose standards are we following CDOT at the city, you know, and so we can either try and get CDOT to change their standards to be more aligned with the cities, <laughs> or we could seriously pursue this question of devolution. 
What does it look like then for um, the Decatur uh, Federal Station? So what I'm what I'm what I'm definitely hearing and what's resonating for me is if BRT is um, one of the guiding kind of transportation, um, not not principles, but kind of um, focus points for these models, then the ones that split traffic um, do, don't sound like they're um, optimal in terms of prioritizing BRT. How then, say if it's the neighborhood connection, um, mm -hmm. how does it interface with the Decatur station? And I don't know if Doug, if you're still on the line, um, but yeah. do you want to answer? Do you want to take a shot at this one? Um, I mean, as far as connecting the buses through there, the having the uh, the traffic signal, I guess, basically at the end of the Colfax viaduct on the east side allows the buses to circulate through there more efficiently so they can come into the station without having to go out of direction and stay going in the right direction, whether they're going east or west. Um, <coughs> And, having and guess, uh, having the connect or having the um, the BRT lines uh, potentially intersect at the intersection of Colfax and Federal uh, allows that um, that transfer to to take place on street without having to to deviate those buses anywhere out out of direction, right. um, so that uh, you know you keep keep them on time, keep them moving fast, which is the goal of the of, of BRT in that regard. Um, and then, you know, overall, this this plan with the neighborhood connection, really with the connection with uh, reconnecting the grid streets through there and and just having more of that uh, available for pedestrians just to to get to and from the transit stops really improves transit um, for the for the overall picture. And I guess just to um, in, in in councilwoman. So one of the things is that the BRT systems, and and Doug, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they will not be going down here. They will not deviate to come down here to pick up you know folks here. Um, they will stay on Federal and Colfax. And what, that would be the intention. Yeah. That would yeah. So it's the local buses. Is the local buses that still run on Colfax, uh, basically being able to deviate coming down here to Decatur Station. And that's the crucial part because basically, um, you know, again, you know, if we get this and, you know, you, you're seeing the level of service F, um, yeah, obviously this is assuming that people are going to continue using their cars, obviously, for, for for every trip that they have out there. But let's assume that it doesn't, that we actually can create a mode shift and it's not as horrible as F, uh, but it's still a D. Um, what RTD, one of the main things are RTD, um, they don't want those local buses to deal with this intersection because that obviously that causes travel delays for them. And then having to deal with this one and then having to deal with this one and then how do you get back on? So by having going this is basically making that U-turn and just dealing with them at, a, you know, at as minimal as possible with those actual turn intersections where they have to turn. Right. Yeah, with the, with the current setup, we end up having to go all the way around Decatur Federal Station on Howard and Decatur and Holden and back up Federal and it, it adds you know four or five minutes to each transit trip going through there. And again, you know, in for transit, you know, three minutes is it's a lot because we are people, we we are human beings, you know, we like our convenience and you know, it is just it is grueling. It can be grueling and it 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 kills the ridership. Five minutes is even worse. So we are one minute <laughs> into this. Um so we developed, um, we're going to be sending this out to you. So um, sort of how we have alluded a little bit, we have developed a matrix um, to sort of try to assess the, you know, where, how each one of these sort of stand when it comes to, again, the, 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 the values that this group set forth at the very beginning of this process. Um, I got to admit, these values are very qualitative um they're not very quantitative so it's really hard to be able to judge you know basically be able to provide a, you a judge how some of this you know will rank um so we are going to send this out to you and basically what we are hoping to do is basically you know we already said this, sent this out to the pmt um now we're going to send it out to you with a couple of changes that the pmt members have already made have already provided and we, what we want you to do is basically take a look at this 
and provide us your comment, your feedback on it. Um, so, you know, basically all of this is the, the way that you all have described it. Here are the ex sort of those bullet point examples of what you all meant. But if you have any ideas, and this is the strengths and weaknesses for each one. So, for example, White Diamond, um, and I also put sort of those different, you know, the different names that we have used throughout this process, the strengths and weaknesses sort of for each one. The last two tabs, um, obviously, are images, if they can actually load up of the, of, and if they can, because my internet, like I told you all, at this point, it becomes tricky. Um, they, these are the, what you all have developed. But what I'm looking for from you all, if you don't mind, just obviously, we're going to send you the actual Excel, Excel version. Please review it. Please make changes. Um, if you don't mind letting me know or just highlight it. If you, you know, if you make a particular change in a box, just highlight it in, in, in yellow. Um, and let me know basically what we're missing. If you can think of, of a quantitative value, quantitative value that we can add for this particular one. So, um, and then any notes that you might have um, about the, you know, this particular option, how the specifically the white diamond meets equity or meets or does not meet equity and mobility, for example, if you don't mind adding notes in there. So we'll be sending this out to you. Um, and then um, the other thing is like sort of like that this updated timeline. Obviously, this baby was supposed to get wrapped up, I think, in April. Clearly, we're past that by this point. Um, and so we're hoping to wrap it up in August. Um, so this is sort of that new established timeline. Um, Jean, and like you mentioned, if you guys, if, if we have all of this information will be posted on the project website. Um, if you want me to present this information or if you want me to have one on ones with, you know, with RNOs or any other organization, please let me know. Shouldn't send me an email. I'll be happy to schedule that. Um, but obviously trying to find that, you know, disperses to as many uh, information as possible. And then basically this is sort of our schedule uh, to wrap up our wrap up schedule. Um, you know, we it, it, the, if you don't mind providing this information out um, by probably I'm going to put a on my email to you all. I'm going to put a deadline probably the first the, the second week or the first week in August where I am hoping to meet with you all again um, that second week sometime in the second week of August. So we're going to be sending you another invite for this where the basically what we're going to take after you send us your comments on the matrix is then because, the, you know, the, the core team is basically going to provide, you know, uh, on the side over here is yes, maybe no. Um, if you want to provide us your input on the yes, maybe no, so that will be great as well, basically under the vote. Uh, but then we're going to provide that comment back to you. And again, this is this is not meant to eliminate any options. This is just to see, to have that, that, uh, that cursory uh, review of how these options um, meet the goals that you all established. Is that simple? If we're at this point, we're not looking at eliminating anything else. We're looking at, you know, setting that that, that baseline, sending it over to to uh, CDOT. We're going to be working with CDOT on what their phase two should be looking at um, and how we can incorporate this element, this effort onto their phase. Um, and then we're going to meet back up with you again um, so that we can discuss the results and then we can finalize this baby. So five minutes over. Uh, questions, comments, what's going on through people's heads right now? Gabby, for me, I'm just wanting to um, get a sense of public access to this information. So I know you said this meeting will be posted on YouTube. The documents, um, like the PowerPoint and the, the matrix survey, where are those going to be online or just emailed to the stakeholders? No, no, they're going to be available online. So this is I'm going to put the bit.ly actually on the chat then uh, because this bit.ly basically takes you to our our project page. And then if you see on our project page, basically we have, you know, here we have all the faces of the project and then the scenario development. This is where we'll be posting this next this, this meeting that you all just saw. So feel free to share um, this. Um, well, um, Oh, shoot, that came out really big. Um, basically, this bit.ly with as many folks as possible. And then uh, I'll put on the same chat the bit.ly for the Dotty um, YouTube page. Great, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Miss Jean, I see you see, uh, have your hand up. And you may be on mute. 
Eugene, I'm, I'm hoping that we can just share it as quickly as possible with the um, the um, NPI steering committee. But I'm wondering, has, has um, Jefferson Park and Sloan's Lake also been invited to weigh in on these conversations? Because, you know, just in terms of mobility, uh, I, I would think they're impacted. And then we also have, I know, Valverde and um, Villa Park, um, you know, have already joined us. So. So we do have, uh, I believe, I do believe, well, I know for sure that Sloan's Lake has been, um, has been invited uh, to, to the PMT. Um, I'm not 100% sure about uh, Jefferson Park. I can definitely check, but Councilwoman Sandoval um, has also, has been, you know, has been invited to his right. meetings and I would I have been briefed on this project as well. And Jean, now that this meeting has taken place, um, I think we can work with Gabby to uh, share the materials and and perhaps even invite uh, the team or members from the team or the project to present um, maybe as early as our next meeting in August. Uh, so we can certainly get information out. Well, and, and there, I mean, and people I think are really wanting to kind of do these deep dives in terms of the planning. I mean, we're getting together, you know, separately on our own. Um, so they may be even interested in meeting outside of the meeting because there is a lot of content here. And, and, thing, and, and I do think one of the problems of the meetings is sometimes it's so overwhelming because we pack so much in. It's hard to digest. And so this almost feels like a meeting in and of itself. So maybe we could give them a, you know, like a teaser for them to see how much there really is um, to chew on. Uh, but I, I do think it almost takes a whole meeting in and of itself. So what I think we can do to your point, Jean, about getting information out and giving uh, the steering committee members time to see it, absorb it, is uh, once this uh, recording gets posted, I think we can pair the the link to the recording with the actual materials themselves. Um, because for anyone that's not familiar or with this project, I think that background that Gabby provided tonight would be really uh, a good foundation for people to understand what it is that's in front of them when they see the, the presentation material. So uh, I will work to create some message that can go along with this information when it goes out. Uh, and then we can kind of take things from there. I think that sounds really good. Thank you. Any other? Sorry, I'm, I'm actually I'm adding on the presentation the the bitly for the YouTube page for Dottie's uh, YouTube page. So. Um, so you will have that as well highlighted on the presentation that we'll be sending out to you all. Um, any other questions, comments? Um, that we have for the team. Eugene, this is Lisa. How are you? Could you add me to this uh, listserv? A absolutely. I, I was on the original your... Cloverleaf Planning Committee back four years ago, maybe. All right, so I'm grabbing your, uh, I think I have your personal email. I'll grab your work email out of here um, just to make sure that we have both for you. And Gabby, if you want to make sure that Lisa is added to your project okay. distribution, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Lisa uh, or Eugene, would you mind putting her email, her information on the chat, please? Or send I it to me. I oh. did towards the beginning. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Perfect. Any other Thank questions, you. comments? No, there's a lot going on, that's for sure, all over the West area, and it's amazing. Can't wait to see when it's all complete. And so, like, you know, um, to hear from the stadium district, I know, I think Jay Roberts was on here, but um, I think the Cloverleaf, wasn't the Cloverleaf built for the stadium? Um, and I know that moving um, transit um, hopefully we've kind of evolved in some of our thinking about what the priorities are, but I know that moving transit has always been an issue. 
um, with the the stadium. And so it would be good to hear, you know, have them weigh in specifically on some of these scenarios. Particularly so as it relates to their potential yeah. development. So we have, um, so, you know, obviously we took the consideration of the proposed um, stadium district and Jay actually, it looks like he had to drop off, but um, we obviously, you know, we've been working with Sarah Kors, who is uh, CPD's stadium district right. uh, project manager on this. Um, stadium district has sort of gone in a little bit of a stall, um, you know, for a little bit. And so because because of that, basically, we, you know, you know, we decided not to meet specifically with stadium district about these just because we don't know if they're actually going to kick off their efforts uh, to redevelop back up yet. Right. Um, and so I think at this point now we can certainly talk about, um, you know, have that more one on one. And this was sort of the kickoff because, again, the stadium district is a stakeholder is not a PMT member. The folks that I talked to one on one were actual um, P, uh, project management team members, RTD, CDOT, um, HTPE, um, and, and so forth, the consultant team about this. So now that it's out in the open, it's, you know, obviously now we can certainly have that one on one with the stadium district about what are their thoughts and their preferred choices. Uh, option for for, for this, um, or if not at all, because again, this is this is very obviously still very visionary. Um, and so there's a lot of things that could change um, from both on their side and our, on our side as well. So, well, uh, they are part of the Sun Valley neighborhood and, uh, you know, we'll be sending it out to the RNO listserv. And so uh, encouraging everyone to take a look at it and, uh, and weigh in. So we'll uh, reach out to them just in a neighborly way. That'll be great. Jean, 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 this is Matt Sugar. I've been on. The, oh, you are Matt. I didn't time. see that. Good. Uh, Matt Sugar from the Stadium District. I, I wasn't able to join the video, but I, I've been on the on the phone side. Um, what I can say is, yes, we're 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 very interested in participating and see what 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 happens here. You are right that we are in a bit of a pause in regard to our our, our development um, for a variety of different reasons. But yes, we, we will be playing close, close attention. Now, with that said, um, there has been a lot of traffic studies and those types of things that, um, you know, part, that were implemented or at least looked at, and I don't want to say implemented, but um, looked at in regard to um, the, the development and the master planning. So you're right, all these things have to, all these pieces of the puzzle do have to go together. Um, yeah, I'm sorry Jay had to drop off. He might have more insight on particular numbers, but a lot of those things have been looked at. Um, so yes, we're, 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 we're happy to participate and we'll continue to. All right, any other uh, comments? Thank you for joining us, Matt. Sorry, you know, I didn't call, it, call you out before. No, I, I wasn't able to participate on the video, so I just I just called in. I apologize for that. All righty, so thank you so much for joining us today. I know it's a lot of information. Again, we'll be sending out the presentation in PDF format. We'll be sending out the matrix, the evaluation matrix um, in Excel format. Again, what we're, what I'm looking for is for you all to basically take a to, to, you know review it. Um, let me know, let us know basically what are we missing or um, how would you vote um, on, on these? Again, they're very qualitative. And so uh, the best that we, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, hiccups. Um, the best that we were able to come up with is, you know, yes, maybe no, um, because becoming anything more than that, it, it, it gets very tricky. Um, but so if you don't mind providing the, your comments, your feedback, that will be amazing. Um, and um, and so just let me know where, if you want me to present, who do you need me to add to the distribution list and so forth. So thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you. Absolutely. Great job, Gabby, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Eugene. Nice seeing you again, Gabby, it's been a while. Yes, it has. <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> the hiccup spells now. 
All righty. Have a lovely night. You too. Bye-bye.